America, thee, ever thee, I sing. I can sing such grandeur and glories about you. I sing America, the prairie grass dividing, demanding the spiritual corresponding of men, demanding the blades to rise of words, acts, beings. Those are the open prairies. Those that go their own way, erect, stepping with freedom and command, leading, not following. Those of inland America, of this America I sing. From the prairies of our nation, from the Illinois farmlands came Abraham Lincoln and Stephen A. Douglas, two men across whose lives fell the shadows of disunion. Tonight, on the Cavalcade of America, DuPont brings you the story of Stephen A. Douglas in a radio play, Eve of Conflict, adapted from the biography by George Fort Milton. The role of Stephen A. Douglas is played by Kenneth Delmar of the Cavalcade Players. <laughs> in Springfield, Illinois, Mary Todd, a young lady from Kentucky, is visiting at the home of her brother-in-law, Ninian Edwards. And one spring evening... Mary? Yes, Ninian? Abe Lincoln and Stephen Douglas are both in the parlor. Oh. What are you going to do about it? They've been courting you for some time now, you know. Mr. Douglas is a clever man, isn't he, Ninian? Douglas is a very smart lawyer, Mary. And Mr. Lincoln? Well, not exactly clever. No. Not like Mr. Douglas at all. Mary. Yes, Minnie? When are you going to make up your mind? Oh, I've already made it up. Good. Well, I, I'm glad to see you're sensible, Mary. After all, I suppose it isn't difficult to choose between Douglas and Lincoln. Minnie, huh? I want to marry. I want to marry a man who's going to be president someday. Oh, oh, oh so that's it. Well, Stephen Douglas has had his eye on the White House all along. I hope you're right, Mary. I know I'm right, Ninian. Just as I'm sure I know which one's going to be President of the United States. Fourteen years passed. Fourteen years, and at the end of them, Mary Todd, Abraham Lincoln, and Stephen Douglas are no longer young. For the nation, it is 14 years of compromise, distrust, and fear. In the America of 1854, secession is imminent. And to a United States Senate rent asunder in sectional conflict goes a new senator from Illinois, Stephen A. Douglas. Then, one day in Washington... Well, well, Senator Douglas, <laughs> howdy. Howdy, Jim. Sit down. Sit down. Thanks, thanks. Well, what's new out in Illinois? Well, Senator, they're mighty riled up over your Kansas-Nebraska bill. Whoever heard of allowing the people in the territories to say for themselves whether they'll become a free or slave state? That's going to cost you votes. Not in the South. That's states' rights. Well, what about the North? That's where you'll hear plenty. Some say you've made a fatal blunder, Steve. Who, for instance, Jim? Well... I had a talk with Lincoln before I left Springfield. He does. Hey, Lincoln, you think I have to worry about him? I'd worry a lot if I were you, Senator. Listen, can't you see you're just straddling? Still compromising with the South. And the North is looking for someone who'll come out flat-footed against slavery. And, well, it might as well be you, Senator Douglas. Yeah, and split the Democratic Party and split the Union wide open? No, my friend. My Kansas-Nebraska bill will save the Union. I'm right about this, Jim. I'm leaving for Illinois in a few days to prove it. Come along, you'll see I'm right. is. They sure got the depot jammed to see you, Senator. <laughs> Reception committee and everything. All right, George. I'll just step out on the rear platform. Senator and... Douglas. 
You don't dare face that howling mob out there. Mob? Why? I wish to address these townspeople. And don't do it, Senator. Don't you see that? They've got a scarecrow burning, and it's got your name on it. My effigy a fire yonder? Sir, I could travel from Boston to Chicago by the light of my own effigies. Open the door, please. I'm going out on the platform. All right, Senator. Fellow citizens! Fellow citizens! Now what's up, Mr. Waiter? What about Kansas, ma'am? Why, Kansas may have slavery if she wants it, but it will never be forced upon her. That is popular sovereignty, fellow citizens. That is free government. It's slave government. That's I do not care, ma'am, whether Kansas votes slavery up or votes it down. It's not for us in the North to say whether slavery is a blessing or a curse. Senator Douglas, you're a Judas. And there are your 30 pieces of silver. Out of my... Please, please, Senator. Come back in the car. This is... All right, George. Perhaps I'd better open the door for the Senator. Well... See what I mean, Senator? That's what they think of you and your Kansas-Nebraska bill in the North. Jim, I know that bill is right. I'll stand by it no matter what the consequences. But if it's right, sir, what about slavery? Slavery's a curse, George, both black and white. Someday we'll stop it off. A curse? But you just said... Yes, I'll... I know. I know. Privately, I can admit it's a curse, my boy, but not publicly. Well, all I say is, it's a good thing you aren't up for re-election to the Senate in Illinois this year. And as for the president, Now, this see, fight involves more than my office, Jim. More than my fame. The union itself is the issue. I will not violate the Constitution to abolish slavery. I will not split the union. The only power that can destroy slavery is the sword. Once that is drawn, no one can see the end. <laughs> where Senator Douglas is having his gathering? Senator Douglas, you'll find him right inside, gentlemen. Thank you. Not at all, not at all. It's open house. You're all welcome. In here, erect, Mr. Lincoln. Oh, yes. There he is. I'm glad to see you, sir. Well, I came to Springfield just to shake hands with you, Senator Douglas. Well, I'm glad to shake hands with you, sir. Well, right to see you here in Springfield, Mr. Lincoln. How are you, sir? Tolerable, thank you, Senator. You're going to speak at the courthouse this afternoon? I am. I'd like to divide time with you. You can have a rebuttal, of course. But, Mr. Lincoln, people came to hear me, and I want to talk with them. Why, well, then it might be necessary to reply to you there tomorrow, Senator. Mr. Lincoln, it looks to me very much like you're dogging me. Well, far from it. Matter of fact, I was going to suggest you dog me tomorrow. You're welcome to be present, and if you wish, reply. Mr. Lincoln, I accept. I shall be there. You are listening to the DuPont Cavalcade of America presenting Eve of Conflict, the story of Stephen A. Douglas. Adapted from the biography by George Fort Milton and starring Kenneth Delmar as Stephen A. Douglas. The Cavalcade of America is brought to you by DuPont, maker of better things for better living through chemistry. October 3rd, 1854. It's wrong to let slavery into Kansas and Nebraska. It's wrong to allow slavery to spread. The South is entitled to equal privileges for their property. Only if there is no difference between hogs and Negroes. I say Negroes are not property. October 6th. The integrity of the Union is worth more to humanity than the whole black race. You forget the Negro is human. Slavery is a great moral wrong. Convict slavery as a sin, and you alienate the South. The end will be disunion.
Washington, D.C., 1857, the home of Stephen A. Douglas. My dear, this is Mr. Herndon of Springfield. How do you do, Mr. Herndon? How do you do? Mr. Herndon is Abraham Lincoln's law partner there. Oh? I'm a little surprised to see you in Washington, Bill. I want to look you in the eye, Senator. <laughs> well, look me in the eye, Bill. I won't dodge. I hope you won't, Senator. I want to ask you some straight questions. I'd like straight answers to take back to Lincoln. How is Lincoln? And how's Mary Todd? I don't see much of Mrs. Lincoln, Senator. But Lincoln? Well, I'll tell you, Senator. Lincoln's not in anybody's way. Not even yours. What do you mean? I mean the Supreme Court decision in the Dred Scott case. I won't talk about that, Herndon. The court ruled Congress hasn't any power to prohibit slavery in a territory. That's all. I see. Anyway, you're going to accept the Illinois Republican endorsement for re-election to the Senate? Herndon, Lincoln's entitled to that. He's the strongest man the Republicans have. Is he? Know what the talk is? In the East, the Republicans advised him not to run on the Illinois ticket for the Senate. Not to stand in your way. But you ought to know that, Senator. Give Mr. Lincoln my best regards, Herndon. Tell him the Democrats already want me as Senator from Illinois, and the Republicans ought to back him. I think they will. Sure you don't mind Abe Lincoln running against you? I think Mr. Lincoln knows the answer to that. In this campaign for the office of United States Senator from Illinois, the issue between Senator Douglas and myself is clear. It is the extension of slavery. A house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure half slave and half free. I do not expect the union to be dissolved. I do not expect the house to fall. But I do expect it will cease to be divided. Stephen. I have a letter from Abe Lincoln. He wants to divide time with me during the present canvas and address the same audiences. Well, isn't it the usual custom to meet your opponent in debate? Yes, but that isn't it. Suppose Lincoln brings up the Supreme Court and the Dred Scott decision. I don't want to argue with him about that, and that's just what Lincoln hopes I'll have to do. But isn't there some question whether the Supreme Court was right? My dear, I can never admit the Supreme Court is wrong. Can't admit it's right either. For if neither Congress nor a territorial legislature can prohibit slavery, where's the right for the people themselves to prohibit it? As I have always held, their right is gone, and my re-election with it. You've gotten yourself into a dreadful muddle, Stephen. Lincoln knows he has everything to gain and I everything to lose by these debates. The country has me measured, whereas he's almost unknown outside the state. But for me, this senatorial election of 1858 is a preliminary to the presidential campaign of 1860. If I lose now, I won't even be considered for the presidency then. What if Mr. Lincoln has his eye on 1860? Oh, Lincoln president? Why, that's ridiculous, my dear. He hasn't a chance. It seems to me, Stephen, you must meet him. Otherwise, the people will think you're afraid of him. Yeah. Yeah, you're right, Adele. And I'm not the least afraid of Lincoln. I guess I'm big enough to meet him anywhere. And I shall. Yes, let's see. Ottawa, Galesburg, Quincy, Freeport, Alton, Jonesboro, and Charleston. Freeport, August 27th, 1858. And let me say in conclusion, my fellow citizens... This is not the first, nor is it the last time I will face my opponent upon the same platform. I will take direct and bold issue with him, as I have here in Freeport and elsewhere. Mr. Lincoln will now address you, and I will reply. Thank you. My fellow citizens, 
I ask my opponent, Senator Douglas, this one question. Can the people of a United States territory, in any lawful way, against the wish of any citizen of the United States, prohibit slavery from its limits prior to the formation of a state constitution? I answer emphatically, they can. How about the Supreme Court? The Dred Scott decision. It matters not what the Supreme Court may decide. If the people are opposed to slavery, they will elect representatives who will, by unfriendly legislation, effectually prevent the introduction of slavery there. Congratulations, Senator. Congratulations, Senator. Thank you, friends. Thank you for your kind words and renewed confidence. And uh, now, if you'll please excuse me. Sure, Good, night. Good night. Good night, sir. Congratulations, Senator, on your re-election. Thanks, Jim. It was a hard fight, and I'm glad it's over. It was over at Freeport. Lincoln lost the election right there, and you won it by your answer. Yes, I suppose I reassured a few doubtful voters in Illinois. But I don't know if the South will ever forgive me, Jim. It's heresy to them. We've got a battle on our hands to get ready for the presidential campaign of 1860. Chicago, May 19th, 1860. The Republican National Convention... The National Democratic Convention. Hello, delegates. I place the nomination for President of the United States, the man who has already met his Republican opponent and defeated him for the senatorship of Illinois. I give you the little child, Stephen J. Douglas. Months later in the presidential year 191860. Election night. All right, folks, the leaders return. Leaders totals for the state. For president of the United States, Bill 21,000. Breckenridge, 29,000. Douglas. running about the same? 
I conceded Lincoln's election about midnight. Oh, Stephen. I guess I might as well have conceded it two years ago at Freeport. You see, Lincoln knew what he was doing. Realized he'd lose the election of 1858. But Lincoln knew the presidential election of 1860 was worth a hundred of that Illinois contest. Still, Stephen, it was a splendid retreat, and I'm proud. Prouder of you than if you'd won now by doing otherwise. I don't know, my dear. I hardly know what to think. And the people of the United States won't know how to take this election either. I wish it had been really decisive. But isn't it? Mr. Lincoln is elected. He's only a minority president, my dear. He has more votes than any of his three opponents. But together we have more than Lincoln. In other words, the country simply isn't all behind him. What if the South refuses to accept his election? I'm afraid we can't stop secession now. What shall I do? What can I do? Over a million people voted for me. Probably two-thirds as many as Lincoln. You see? Yes, I think I do, Stephen. With your support, Mr. Lincoln might have the majority of the nation behind him. If they'd follow me. But without it, disunion is certain. Well, we'll see. We'll see when Abraham Lincoln and Mary Todd get to Washington. It was thoughtful of you and Mrs. Douglas to call on us, Stephen. I believe my husband is an old beau of yours, Mrs. Lincoln. Yes, Mrs. Douglas. And if I'd have been Mary Todd, I'd have picked Senator Douglas as a husband instead of me. <laughs> <laughs> but you weren't Mary Todd. And now, if you gentlemen will excuse us. Of course. Mrs. Douglas, this way. Mr. President, I... Uh, not quite president yet, Senator. <laughs> I learned long ago, following circuit out in Illinois, not to cross bridges before you come to them. Illinois. You and I fought each other pretty much all over the state, didn't we, Mr. Lincoln? Yes, we certainly did, Douglas. Mr. Lincoln, I've heard rumors of trouble at the inaugural. I'd like to stand behind you on the platform. Well, it won't be the first time we've shared platforms, Douglas. No. But this time, if any man attacks you, he attacks me, too. I want there to be no question in any mind of where I stand. However much we've fought, we've never differed, have we? In our devotion and attachment to the Constitution and the Union. No, we haven't. I guess we always took that for granted. I'm on the side of the Union, sir. And I pledge you all my aid, all my strength, and all my energy in whatever course you take to save it. You cheer and warm my heart, Douglas. I wanted you to know, Mr. President. I thank you with all my heart. The people with us and God helping us all will yet be well. God bless you, Douglas. days later, a recently constructed platform before the unfinished Capitol building in Washington. There sits Stephen A. Douglas. Before him, facing the inaugural throng, stands the tall, gaunt figure of Abraham Lincoln. The gusty March wind is chilly that day in 1861, and not all in the crowd can hear the words of the president-elect. But there is one close by him who does, one who understands them, one who might have held the office of president himself but who now holds only the stovepipe hat of Abraham Lincoln, Stephen A. Douglas, the Little Giant. We are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic chords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of union when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nation. 
Tonight, DuPont's story of chemistry at work in our world is in a field in which public education has a tremendous job to do, now as well as in the future. It is a fact, and a shocking fact, that only one American in three owns a toothbrush. It is a fact that in large areas of the United States, men and women and children still go to the dentist not to have an aching tooth cleaned or filled, but to have it pulled. And it is a fact, regrettable and unpleasant, but still a fact, that millions of Americans do not go to a dentist at all, have never visited one. The modern dentist, many Americans still need to learn, is a man who saves teeth. A scientist himself, he has all of modern dental science at his command. The contributions of chemistry to dental science are noteworthy. Today, the dentist can actually look inside a tooth and find out what's wrong with it, thanks to X-ray photography. DuPont X-ray film, a product of chemistry, has replaced guesswork with knowledge. And when treatment becomes necessary, we no longer need to suffer pain. Gas and other safe, effective anesthetics are available. Those, too, are contributions of chemistry. The amalgam and porcelain the dentist uses for his fillings, along with gold, are products of the laboratory that have been improved and improved again by the research chemist. And at the present time, DuPont chemists are at work on a plastic which, if it passes the exacting tests demanded by the profession, will give dentists a new material for inlays, light, acid-resistant, and so precisely matched to the color of your teeth as to be virtually invisible. The cold sterilization that keeps the dentist's instruments free of germs is a chemical contribution, too, as are many of the antiseptics and drugs he uses, from the methylates to sulfonilamide. And while it's still too early to hold out promise, experiments underway suggest that a solution of crystalline carbamide used as a mouthwash may be of help in enabling us someday to say goodbye to cavities forever. Ingredients for toothpastes, tooth powders, and mouthwashes, toothbrushes with plastic handles and sanitary nylon bristles that don't get soggy, DuPont dental x-ray film, lucitone denture material allowing the dentist to make dentures that are strong, that assure a lasting fit, that are permanent in color, all are contributions to dental science of the chemist who brings you, in the words of the DuPont Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. Next week, the Cavalcade of America presents Jeanette Nolan in a romantic play about the Indian maiden whose name was Sacagawea. Her simple faith in the great American explorer, William Clark, forms a beautiful and touching story that has enriched the legendary lore of our country. In our story of chemistry at work in our world, we will tell you about cellophane cellulose film and how it safeguards and preserves the food supply of the nation. We hope you'll join us at the same time next week when DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. Our play was written by Garrett Porter and was adapted from Eve of Conflict, the biography of Stephen A. Douglas by George Fort Milton, published by Houghton Mifflin. The orchestra and the original musical score were under the direction of Don Voorhees. On the Cavalcade of America, your announcer is Clayton Collier, sending best wishes from DuPont. <laughs> This is the Red Network of the National Broadcasting Company.